Good afternoon. My name is Pedro Adrián de Anda Plasencia, and I'm this year's CHCI Public Policy Fellow presented by New York Life. I am delighted to be here with you today for this panel discussion titled Championing Latino Film and Representation, Diverse Talent Pipelines in Film and Television. Film and television are powerful mediums that shape our perception of the world. When these mediums fail to represent the diversity of the real world, they can perpetuate stereotypes and distort our understanding of different cultures, backgrounds, and experiences. Diverse representations help to more accurately reflect the reality of our diverse society and has the potential to shape attitudes, promote inclusivity, and enrich storytelling. As a gay Latino myself, I understand the value of seeing our intersectional identities reflected on the big screen, and I can only think about the impact and empowerment that seeing these stories told on the big screen would have had on my younger self. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank the Walt Disney Company for their generous support of this session. Now it is my honor to introduce Representative Joaquin Castro, this session chair for the panel. Congressman Joaquin Castro is now in his sixth term in the U.S. House of Representatives, serving the 20th District of Texas in the San Antonio area. Representative Castro serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He was the 2013 co-president for the House Freshman Democrats and the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus for the 116th Congress. Having experienced America's promise firsthand, Representative Castro wants to help build out what he calls the infrastructure of opportunity so that future generations will have the same chance to pursue their American dream. He believes that just as there is infrastructure of transportation that helps get us to where we need to be on the road, there is an infrastructure of opportunity that helps Americans get to where they want to go in life. Please join me in welcoming Representative Joaquin Castro. Thank you, Pedro, for that great introduction, and uh, thank you to CHCI for putting on this discussion. I know there are so many different topics uh, that we could talk about. I know many of them are being discussed, but thank you so much for putting on a discussion on this, and also to Disney, our sponsor, for, for having us here, for convening us. Uh, I'm Joaquin Castro. I'm very lucky to represent my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, in the House of Representatives. Some San Antonians, hopefully some Texans here. I grew up in neighborhoods that were 95% or more Latino, mostly Mexican-American in San Antonio. And it was remarkable because I grew up with my twin brother, Julian, and every day we would watch television after school, and we would watch the Dukes of Hazard and Different Strokes and uh, you know, all these television shows. And the world that I would see on screen never matched the world I saw when I stepped outside out of the, off the you know, porch into the, my west side neighborhood. Those two things never seem to converge. And the reason that it's so important that Latinos and Latinas are represented in film and television and mass media is because Hollywood is still the main image defining and narrative creating institution in the United States and therefore around the world. And that's important because Latinos exist in a kind of cultural black hole. And let me tell you what I mean by that. The Latino narrative, the story of Latinos, our contributions, uh, the positive things that we've done in the history of this nation, has often been left out of the telling of the larger American story. So you have a big part of the country that literally has no clue who we are or what positive things our community and the people from our community have done for the prosperity and the development of the United States of America. Our successes in government, in business, in science, in arts, in culture, all of these things. And so part of the way that we remedy that, part of the way that you fill that black hole is through mass media and film and television and making sure that Latino and Latina stories, that our community stories are told. But not only stories of our community, but that our presence is acknowledged if you go back and you look at what is considered the golden age of Hollywood, and even beyond those years, you'll notice that there were films that were often set in places where in real life, like my West Side neighborhood, you had a lot of Latinos that were living in those places. But it was never reflected in the television shows or the films of the time. So part of the, the fight has been to, to just have existence on films and television shows. And then from there, to have some kind of prominence 
right? To, for us to have uh, Latinos and Latinas who played significant roles in film and television. And then from there, a focus on our stories. So for example, uh, one example lately is A Million Miles Away about the astronaut Jose Hernandez, a, success, a migrant worker who became uh, an astronaut, a Latino who came from very, very humble beginnings and became an astronaut. So all of those three things, our presence, our prominence, and our focus are important. But none of that happens, none of that remedy happens. You can't fill that cultural black hole, at least the mass media part, unless there are individuals who step up and take on the role of filmmaker. The creatives who are directors and producers and actors and actresses and all of it and, and you know, are on stage and theater. And so I want to say thank you to them for sharing their creativity with us. Thank you for them for not giving up. Sometimes even though our young people don't always see others from their neighborhood who have blazed the trails that they wish to travel for, for continuing and going forward, and also for being trailblazers for the people that are coming behind you, whether it's your brothers and sisters or cousins or neighbors who hear about your success and, say, and it helps them believe that they can then do what you have done. So thank you so much and very best of luck and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you again, Congressman Castro, for your remarks and for all that you do for the Latino community in Texas and across the country. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Maheen Ibrahim from the Walt Disney Company to provide brief sponsor remarks. Please join me in welcoming Maheen. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you, Representative Castro, for your poignant remarks. My name is Maheen Ibrahim, and I'm the Director of Creative Talent Pathways for the Representation and Inclusion Strategies Team for the Walt Disney Studios. I know that was a lot of alphabet soup. I am one of the partners, along with Adrian Cistellini and Richard Ruiz from Searchlight, on the Imaginar Latino Creative Producers Residency, led by Film Independent in consultation with NALIP, the National Association of Independent Latino Producers. We have Di Diana Luna, the Executive Director, here in the room. <laughs> Disney has a long-standing relationship with CHIC and our shared commitment to develop the next generation of Latino leaders. And I am delighted to once again be with you all today for this year's conference. To tell you a little bit about our brand new program, over the course of nine months, our three extraordinary fellows who were competitively selected for this program receive a $50,000 cash grant to use to advance their projects or their careers, however they would like to use those funds, mentorship, professional and financial coaching, project development support, and more. Our fellows are also in the process of meeting Disney and Searchlight executives to gain traction on their projects. At Disney, we remain deeply committed to underrepresented storytellers and untold stories. And it is with our valued partnerships with organizations like CHCI that drive this work forward. In addition to programs like Imaginar, we have a slate of creative talent programs dedicated to this work, including the Disney Launchpad Shorts Incubator, where our short films will release on Disney Plus, September 29th for season two. And with that, I would like to say thank you to Marco and the entire CHCI team for your dedication to this work and to drive inclusion forward in the entertainment industry and beyond. And I would like to thank our panelists here today. We have Angela, Dia, Gia, Nico, and Maria. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to them to get us started on this conversation. If we can have another round of applause for Maheen, please. So thank you again for those remarks and to Disney for their support of CHCI and of this session. Now I'm excited to welcome our moderator, Angela Lee. Angela is a Spirit Award winning nominated producer who also serves as a director 
of artist development and the arts nonprofit Film Independent. In this role, she oversees the fiction and nonfiction labs programs, including Fast Track Finance Market, Fiscal Sponsorship Program, and Project Evolve. A native Chicagoan, Angela graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in economics. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to Angela. Thank you so much, Pedro. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, thank you to the Walt Disney Company, to Adrian, to Maheen, and to CHCI for um, putting the spotlight on something that's very near and dear to my heart, the importance of inclusion and representation in the film and television industry, um, as Representative Castro spoke so beautifully. And thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, we are excited to have this conversation and you've been doing these panelings for the past couple days so you know what the drill is. If you want to share any thoughts or questions at the end, we will have a Q&A. Um, we'd love to hear from you and if you want to share your thoughts with hashtags, if you're more social media savvy than me, use that hashtag, C-H-C-I-M-M, uh, uh, sorry, C-H-C-I-H-H-M-23. Um, but I am delighted to have this conversation because as described in this panel, um, through a recent study by the Annenberg Institute, over the course of 1,300 films between 2007 and 2019, only 3% of the producers of those films identified as Latino. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the entertainment industry, but producers are crucial to ensuring inclusive representation in the stories that we see. And today, we're here to demystify that over the next hour. Allow me to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. We have Dia Vazquez, Associate Director of Fiction Programs at Film Independent. Everyone. Producer Maria Altamirano. Producer Nico Blanco. <laughs> and producer Gia Rigoli. So we're going to start and just kind of hear, I mean, this is about storytelling, right? So let's start off with hearing a little bit about our panelists and what drew them to a storytelling career. And I think, I think we all want to know, I think we all grew up with something that inspired us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us maybe a film or show that really made an impact on you growing up. I'm going to start with Dia. All right. Uh, well, I was born in Mexico, raised in Southern California, and bounced between the two throughout my childhood. And during that time, my real anchor, besides, of course, my family, uh, was my love of storytelling, and particularly film and television, and particularly television. This is back before streaming, and I had the TV guide memorized, and I would always wake up at 2.30 in the morning on Fridays to watch my favorite show, The Joey Bishop Show, <laughs> which was a family comedy about an agent in the 50s. Um, one of the things that really drew me to these types of shows was I was an immigrant, and I didn't quite understand how this country worked and I really learned how to be an American by watching these old shows. I understood what Thanksgiving was, how Christmas worked, how the Easter Bunny worked. These are things that were not taught to me by my Mexican mother who had a very different idea of how those things worked. But what drew me to entertainment besides like an overwhelming love for it was it didn't always love me back. You know, I didn't see myself in these shows. It didn't look like my family. The structures were different. And I knew that what I wanted to do with my career was to make it more equitable, to make sure that there's not going to be another little brown girl growing up in Southern California that doesn't see herself and wonders where her place is. Thank you, Dia Maria. Yes, uh, first, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am Peruvian American with roots in Lima and in Downey, California, which is a predominantly Latino suburb of Los Angeles. And I spent my childhood in Lima, and I remember vividly when I was a kid watching a lot of movies with my family, you know, Jurassic Park, E.T., Grease, which I fell in love with. And I think those films opened up my world, um, connected me to my, I had been born in the States, but just kind of by accident. I you know, was growing up in Peru and, and it started connecting me to this other part of me and also the bigger world and I um, dreamed of someday kind of being a part of it. And you know, as many of us do, 
throughout childhood and beyond, I just kind of connected to the actors or the storytelling and didn't really understand the behind the scenes and how to play a role in what kind of stories were being told until much later in life. But I, um, just fast forwarding a little bit, one of the films that stuck with me the most is soon after high school I watched The Motorcycle Diaries mm -hmm. starring um, Gael Garcia Bernal and it was one of the first kind of introductions to independent cinema and I started becoming very interested in foreign films and I, there's, a, there's a sequence obviously that is shot in, in Peru and I was so immersed in my own culture for one of the first times ever in a film that I was like, I need to be doing that for someone else. So that's what kind of drew me to it. And many years later, here I am. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maria G. Yeah. Nico? Um, yeah, like everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, I was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. <laughs> I was born in a very, I was raised in a very conservative environment and I think, um, a show that had a great impact on me when I was 12 years old. I stumbled upon the Showtime show Queer as Folk, which is not a show for 12 year olds. But <laughs> um, at the time, I remember I was like mesmerized and mind blown by this show. It was a window into a culture I didn't even know was my own at the time. And it served as a lifeline for several years through me. Like I'd kept me company and it really like made me understand my world and like my place in the world in a way that I wouldn't have been able to without this show. And I knew right then and there that I wanted to do this for someone else. I wanted to be able to connect through people via entertainment and just let them know that they're not alone because sometimes it can be a very lonely world. Um, so I knew right and there that I wanted to work on film, but also being born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, I did not know that working in film was an actual thing people do. <laughs> so it took several years for me. Uh, I worked in finance and marketing, and then when I was in New York, I stumbled upon this production company and started working in producing, and I haven't looked back. Yeah. We're so, we're so happy that you made that choice. <laughs> uh, Gia? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I've never used one of these mics. Um, when I think about the moment that made me want to work in a film, I thought about this a lot, and I don't think I can really pinpoint an exact moment. I feel like it was always kind of inevitable for me. I was really obsessive when I was young about pop culture and everything. I like devoured books and video games and TV shows and movies. So. I think it was just storytelling was always a huge passion of mine, but like many others, I really didn't see myself reflected on screen. You know, I was obsessed with like Hannah Montana and everything else, but no one that really looked like my community. I grew up and was born and raised in a small border town called Nogales, Arizona. That's a twin city with Nogales, Sonora. Pretty much everyone there is Mexican as well. So it was just, I found myself trying to be someone that I wasn't or trying to attain an image that seemed impossible. Um, and because I was raised in such a tiny town, we didn't even have a movie theater. So the internet was really a huge tool for me because it allowed me to access cinema, not just from you know Latino filmmakers in the US, but all over the world. And it kind of opened my eyes up. But even then, kind of like Nico said, pursuing a career in film didn't really seem attainable or something that was possible. My parents didn't go to college. So of course, I was pushed into the sciences and math, but it wasn't something that I was really good at, and when I was thinking back on this question, I realized that's when I started watching films by um, American independent filmmakers like Slacker, that I really realized this was a career I could pursue. Slacker was made, I think, for about $20,000, and you know Richard Linklater made it with his friends in his hometown in Texas, and it kind of opened my eyes to, you know, I could do this even in Nogales. I didn't have to be in Hollywood or New York City or these giant cities, so. I went to Chapman University, I graduated with a BFA in creative producing, and I produced my first micro-budget film when I was still a junior in college, and I've been doing that ever since. A perfect segue towards talking about producing. I think for many of those who might be outside of the business, kind of know what a director does, knows what an actor does, understands what a writer does, but producing, I think people have different ideas, but. If I were to ask you, you might be a little bit less certain about how to define that. Do they just find money? Do they just work for some large company? What does it mean? So let's turn to our experts. <laughs> Maria, yes. how would you define producing? 
Um, it's a big question, <laughs> so I'm glad I'm going first. Uh, no, I, I, I think a producer is a combination of project manager meets CEO of an entre you know, a startup company meets creative entity, creative director, and also a little bit of therapist and mom <laughs> thrown in there. Because as a producer, your main goal, I would say, and please jump in if you disagree, mm -hmm. is to um, support the create, you know, a, a creative vision, whether that's something that you were inspired to develop, whether it's a book or a, story, a short story or a short film that wants to be a feature, whatever the source material is, your goal is to take that and turn it into a movie, and there's a ton of steps in between that a producer is responsible for putting together as the puzzle, like the puzzle pieces that go mm -hmm. into making a film. Um, and if I could add, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I had a bit of a long journey to end up on this side of film, but initially I was on the marketing side. I was the market researcher for one of the studios, and something that really stuck with me about producers was that they were involved in every step of the way, you know, from very early development studies when even the studio was de determining whether to even make a film, all the way to that opening weekend and putting the trailers in theaters, et cetera. And so that really kind of crystallized for me that producing might be what I wanted to do to be able to creatively and kind of supervisorially oversee the, the film and therefore have such a strong impact on what kind of story it is, how it's told, who's hired in front of and behind the camera. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of many things. It isn't just sourcing the financing or, you know, um, finding the story, it's really seeing it all the way through in my eyes. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that your job as a producer is to champion the film, whatever it is. A lot of the times you're there before the director's involved. Like uh, sometimes you have the idea from the very inception, you develop it with a writer, you help pick the right director, you help assemble the right team, you help assemble the below the line crew. Um, you're just like helping put together the film once everyone goes home because like production's over, you're there championing it through post-production, then you're doing the festival strategy, you're making sure like what distribution company would be best for this film, you're like years later still paying taxes on the film after you already wrapped it, like uh, it's, yeah. you're there from the very beginning to like the whole life the film will ever have, um, which is like a long, long time. And uh, you're like there when no one is getting paid, you're just there trying to make it happen out of nothing. That's what the producer is mm -hmm. trying to do. You're trying to get the money to pay everyone and hopefully yourself too when you're <laughs> making the movie. Um, but yeah, I think that that's what a producer does. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a really, really long process. I have films I've been working on for five years that don't have a cent of money in, that we're not even close to filming, um, that we're all super passionate about. You know, you can have a film come up and it's finance and it goes and you film in a month and everything's amazing, but other times you're working on stuff for years and years. And like Nico said, uh, most of it, I would say for indie producers is unpaid labor, which is a huge discussion that has been going on in the indie producing community because it's just so unsustainable. We often don't get paid until the film actually shoots and goes into production and then sells after. So it's just years of development work and championing the film and carrying it through. And you know, a lot of larger studios and larger films with bigger budgets, you have an entire team around you. But when you're an indie producer, we're often doing the work of 20 people. We're the accountant, we're the production manager, we're the line producer, we're the coordinator, we're the, the PA, we're the driver. I, the amount of vans I still drive is so silly. Um, so it just involves wearing so many hats and I really don't think it's such an uphill battle and so exhausting at times that you really have to love the work you do and the people you work with to get through it. I think from all of that, I mean, you recognize, I, I always like to say producing is like giving birth. Mm -hmm. The gestation period is way longer than nine months, <laughs> but the end product, the love in that end product is so important. But also I think to Maria and Nico's point regarding um, producers, they're there at the inception, mm -hmm. they're there throughout, they're part of finding the collaborators and the key hires, and that is where you can have inclusion and representation, and that is why 
producers are so important in the stories that they pick and the people that they hire. And that's why this role is so important. I feel like it's a natural segue to talk about some of the projects that you've worked on um, and what inspired, and, and I guess what, in, what stories inspire you to work on it, knowing that it's so difficult and challenging. We'll start with Gia. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I am very genre agnostic. You know, I don't gravitate towards horror or drama or anything in particular. It's really about the team. And to be honest, when I get hired for other jobs or I have an opportunity to go on different sets, it really is jarring how few Latinos, if any, there ever are on set because just naturally the community that I hang around with and the type of stories that I'm drawn to and my friends and my peers are Latino or other minorities, so my sets always kind of reflect the real world. Um, so I'm just really drawn to untold stories, like Maheen said, very unique perspectives. You know, I'm developing something on the border where I'm from, but I also work with filmmakers from Venezuela and Colombia and other countries. So um, just very unique perspectives. I have to be passionate about the story. And I always really am interested in learning why the director and the writer wants to tell that story. It has to be really meaningful because like we said, we're there from the inception and we have to love this thing for five plus years. Um, so I'm lucky to work with like a variety of different filmmakers across all genres, across all countries. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that um, I'm still unsure what it is that drives me to tell the stories I like to tell. It's always <laughs> just when I find the script and I read it, sometimes I'm like, they're like, there's no money for this, and you're, and I was like, oh, I'm not even, I'm not interested in this project. Then I read the script, and I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm gonna have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just like finding a story that moves you, an interesting point of view, like mm -hmm. just mentioning. That's really, really important. I've also been working in uh, nonfiction, and I think that there's like this real beauty in finding like real life stories that like need to be shared out there with the world. Um, I think one of the projects that I'm most proud of was like uh, I was a story producer for this documentary that was like um, about this people trafficking Palestinians into Israel to work at low construction sites and it was just like such a beautiful film such like so much humanity on screen to see and like uh, just being able to be part of projects that are like sharing the human experience and making you question what it is that makes us human and like how we're all like connected somehow. Um, so I think that just looking for the right collaborators, when you find them, you just find them and you're like, okay, let's, let's join this battle that it is telling film, I guess. <laughs> I'm gonna interject really quickly because you have a wide audience who, are, who, are, who absorb content, wanna know what to watch. I mean, Gia, you just went to Locarno Film Festival. Want to tell us about your film? And I, everyone's got some things going on. So you, <laughs> sure. <laughs> news. Yeah, sure. Um, so I just went to Locarno Film Festival, which is a film festival in Switzerland. Um, and that was a treat because I really got to meet filmmakers from all over the world. And we were part of a program called Open Doors that actually focuses on Latin American cinema, specifically smaller countries um, like Venezuela. So. The film that I worked on um, is about the Venezuelan, um, cur the current situation in Venezuela. The director is on asylum in the U.S. from Venezuela. Um, so it's very specific, and they really took a chance on us. And much like you know the programs that we're doing here, they introduced us to a lot of other financiers and production companies and just try to give us as many resources as possible to make these movies. Um, so that was very special, and it was just nice to... You know, some of these um, countries and communities, they're just starting kind of their filmmaking journey. So it was really nice to meet people that are kind of at our level that we can collaborate now and hopefully years in the future. Nico, want to talk about? Um, I guess the last film that I've been working on, it's called Cowboy Choker Harness and Heart. We just played at Outfest. We're now going to be playing a new fest. And um, it really is an exploration about, like, the queer community and how it differs from like the straight community in a way that I find it's really interesting. Um, I love being able to see, I think it's a project that's very close to my heart. Um, I had trans people on screen, behind the scenes, like uh, everyone on set like was queer. Like I mentioned, like a big part of being a producer is that you are like the person that's like building the set. Mm -hmm. And like we get to see a lot of diversity when we're on like on screen. We've been seeing diversity more and more for years. It's a box we kind of want to tick constantly, but no one actually really puts up the fight to have diversity behind the scenes. Because 
behind the scenes the people who are making the movies always still look the same even if like on screen it's still different and I think that that's a thing that we need to change. So um, I'm very proud of that film because I think that I made a really big effort to make sure that what we were seeing on screen was really what was behind the screen as well. So powerful. Maria? Um, yeah, so I work primarily in the fiction space, both in film and TV, and the types of stories I'm very drawn to, the best way I usually describe them is I like things that are bold, and whether that's in the storytelling and form, in the subject matter, or even who's in front of or behind the camera, something that just has teeth or moves me um, in a visceral way, I, I really love. Um, and like Nico and Gia said, I tend to be very intentional about who's hired behind the scenes because everything pours into what you watch on that screen. Um, and um, in some of the work I've done, so I produced a film called Son of Monarchs, which um, premiered at Sundance a few years ago and was picked up by HBO. You can watch it on Max. Um, it starts the Noche Huerta, and it was shot between Mexico and um, New York. And I also worked on Los Spookies, an HBO comedy show, yes. <laughs> um, sadly got canceled. Uh, but Los Spookies, you know, similarly to, to them, I'm genre agnostic. I, I just kind of want something that is bold. And Los Spookies is, um, in many ways, uh, you know, the, the more type of work that we need to put out there um, that is representing our community, but it's not about being Latino, it's just people being people <laughs> um, in the strangest ways. Uh, and most recently, I produced a film called All Dirt Rose Tastes of Salt, which uh, will premiere later this year. Uh, it's produced with A24 and Barry Jenkins' company Pastel, and was shot entirely in Mississippi, um, tells the story of a black woman from um, her youth to her older years and told very lyrically and I welcome you all to see it. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of kind of parallels that we're finding in our work as we move through, you know, this year and, and that's always very exciting. Um, independent filmmaking is not for the faint of heart and oftentimes artists can feel so solitary in their journey. Um, and so I want to ask each of you, are there um, programs or organizations that have been supportive of you to help break the barrier and provide access and support to, on this journey? Uh, absolutely. The, answer, the short answer is yes. I think as a filmmaker, it is so crucial that you tap into the resources that are there and organizations like Film Independent truly could make a difference in advancing our careers. I always like to tell the story that when I was I was working in the nonprofit sector in one of my past lives. I was working in the nonprofit sector, but still had that itch wanting to work in film. Had no idea how to enter it. I lived in Los Angeles, but I didn't have family in the business and any of the stuff that sometimes allows you to better understand what to do. And so I decided to volunteer at the LA Film Festival, which, LA, which um, Film Independent would put every year. And it was magical. <laughs> I got to kind of immerse myself in these rooms, you know, be at the panels, and it kind of solidified my desire to figure it out and wanting to be on the other side. And so years later, as I kind of navigated through film school and started figure, you know, trying to carve a path, I revisited Film Independent and tapped into their resources again, and I did their producing lab. Um, you know, and, and many of my projects uh, in the early stages in order to be able to get through development because as Gia said, you typically don't have funds for that as a producer. You're trying to figure out how to even just get a little bit of money so that you can spend time writing the script or you can you know, do some research. Um, organizations like Film Independent, you know, there are others, um, SF Film, the Sundance Institute, Gotham, there are so many wonderful resources that have allowed my projects and me as an individual to be able to progress in this industry. Uh. Yeah, I think first and foremost, I mean, obviously Film Independent has been like key to what I've been doing and what I'm able to do right now. They're great in supporting like artists and they find like really great partners to do it with, like Disney um, and Nalip as well. I think it's really, really great as like, uh, just to have the support of, because breaking in into this industry is not easy. 
Um, I was also luckily uh, able to be a part of the Latino Film Institute for which I was a fellowship manager because they also have fellowships that are geared towards like Latino filmmakers. Um, one with Netflix and one with Amazon, one supporting like kids from East LA and one supporting 10 Latino filmmakers. I think there's a lot of resources out there and nonprofits play a huge, huge role in like nurturing the careers of like up and coming artists because uh, no one else will do it. So I'm so thankful that they are, um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, same for me. Um, definitely would not be where I am without Film Independent. As I mentioned, I moved to Los Angeles for college when I was 18, and a lot of kids at my film school had so much experience already somehow. Like, they had incredible film programs at their high schools. I didn't have any of that. I've never used a camera. Um, so I didn't know what to do, so I Googled arts organizations and found Film Independent and started out as an intern and then I kind of never left. Like I, <laughs> I just badgered them for years and years. Um, from that I did a program called Project Involve, which was an absolute game changer for me and so many others. It really helped expand my network um, from just my uh, Chapman University crowd and taught me so much we're able to make a short film during that program and I also came back for Fast Track and now um, Imaginar and like Nico said there's just a wealth of resources out there from nonprofit organizations. I was also an elite fellow prior to this program as well and Disney and Searchlight have been unbelievably supportive during this whole process so definitely super thankful and it gives me you know there's hard days in indie films but it gives me a lot of hope. Well, Dia, tell us a little bit more about your work at Film Independent and, you know, what drew you to work at Film Independent? Yeah, absolutely. So I started my career actually making commercials for the Hispanic market, which was very interesting. But then that company went under because general market directors realized there's a lot of money in the Hispanic market. And then I went to an agency um, and worked there for a number of years got to the point where my boss really wanted me to become an agent. And being an agent is fascinating and exciting and it's like working in a pressure cooker. Um, but it wasn't exactly how I wanted to support artists. So if my boss didn't want to be an agent, it didn't go over well. Uh, six months later, I found myself working at Film Independent. And Film Independent has been an incredibly fulfilling place to get to support artists like the three incredible producers that are on the stage with me and get to support like, the art that they want to make, the way that they want to make it. While we have an eye towards commerce, we want them to be successful, it really is about their visions and their careers and in all of the different ways that we're able to support them. And why don't I talk a little bit about what we do at Film Independent. So Film Independent is an LA-based nonprofit arts organization that was founded by independent filmmakers, for independent filmmakers, and we support independent filmmakers, and that takes many forms. We have a screening series where we screen their work. We have education series for our members so that they understand like, all the different aspects of entertainment. And what Angela and I do is we run the artist development filmmaker programs where we support fiction and nonfiction features, both in development and post-production, and episodic projects in development. And the foundation of artist development is Project Involve. And we're actually celebrating 30 years of artist development. <laughs> and for 30 years, Film Independent has been supporting underrepresented voices. And as Angela likes to say, we were doing DEI work before DEI departments existed. Um, in Project Involve, we support filmmakers in different tracks, writers, directors, producers, cinematographers, editors, executives, animators, uh, and festival programmers, because we believe it's about diversifying all aspects of film. and. Like our goal at Film Independent is when these folks walk into studio spaces, walk into production companies, the people on the other side of the table are from their communities. They understand their stories so that when they're pitching, it's, it's a conversation among equals and there's never a barrier of, oh, I don't quite, I can't quite access that because it's not something that I've personally experienced. I think it's a good segue from what Dio was talking about in our artist development programs. I and mean, we have core programs that support artists as you know it. Um, but I also love how nimble we can be and um, you know, be proactive to our artists' community on their needs. Um, and 
When we are programming our producing labs, actually all of our labs, we always want to make sure that the advisors and the experts that we bring in are as inclusive as the filmmakers that we're supporting. Um, but I was having trouble with our producing lab and finding Latino producers to be our advisors, you know? Uh, again, to this study, case in point. And as a producer myself, I just, I had always been looking for support and pitching this idea of supporting producers. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we certainly rely on our community, but wonderful partners like the Walt Disney Company and Searchlight Pictures who understand our vision. And so we had an amazing conversation where we talked about this need and this gap um, where we need to, we need, we're like, how do we build this pipeline for Latino producers to get them to the studios so that they're making and green lighting not just independent movies but big studio movies too. And that's how we birth the Imaginar Producers Residency, um, which I think is so, so, so incredible. And we did that in collaboration with Nalip. Thank you so much, Diana. It's been such a joy working with you and Vanessa and your team. Um, and we've been working since March. So why don't we hear a little bit more? I mean, Mahin told us a little bit about the details, but let's hear from the filmmakers about how the program has made an impact on them. Nico, want to start? Um, sure. I think, uh, well, just having the support of Searchlight behind you and developing your projects has been like a great, great, like it opened so many doors. Like um, being able to just go and pitch your ideas to agencies who are so receptive to hearing your ideas. Like it's already like a huge difference, especially when you're working for mostly like the independent side. Um, and also just you get invaluable feedback of like being able to work within the studio system and getting the notes that you usually would get to do so. So you will have a clearer picture of what it is that um, bigger studios are like looking for and what it is to work in that system. Um, so I think that that's been really, really great. Um, also, like just getting to meet my other two producers who I work with, I think it's a great <laughs> thing as well because when you're surrounded by people who you believe are talented, it also pushes you to be better, I believe. So that's always like a really great aspect of the program, I believe, as well. Um, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I agree with all of that. You know, having support systems as a filmmaker, of course, um, is invaluable. I think. What makes independent producing a bit unique is that a lot of people don't understand it, but at the core, it is, we are artists, you know, like writers, directors, like uh, someone who's a, who's a painter. It is a, a tough um, space to make art and make a living, and there are just very limited opportunities for producers in particular to have the support systems that other artists do. And I think part of that is because people don't fully understand the role. <laughs> um, and with that comes, you know, it's difficult to build a sustainable career. Um, and so I think truly the financial support is huge. We don't often get that. And in the same way that writers and directors, $50,000. $50,000. Each yes. one of them got to support their work when none of their films you know, yes. pay them for their development time. So thank you, Disney, for that. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it often comes down to and why sometimes it's tough for artists of certain communities to be able to move forward. Um, you know, if you are come from an immigrant background, first generation, whatever it may be, I think it's just the, 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 tr the truth of it comes down to having, you know, less financial stress or feeling like there is a path forward. And I think more programs for producers need to be put in place because, again, it, it usually is for writers, directors, or other types of artists. Um, and then beyond that, of course, the ability to um, immerse ourselves in the studio system, which, uh, again, it, it is a, a, a complicated step <laughs> to... to um, to make in the, from the independent space into the studio system. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, I think uh, I'll echo Nico, getting to uh, spend this much time with each other and also truly take time to focus on ourselves is unique. You know, having a financial coach, you know, uh, a life coach, <laughs> all of the things that typically we don't do for ourselves as producers and filmmakers in general. 
Yeah, it's been super validating. I mean, I really resonate with what you say because we're so often left out of conversations um, about filmmakers and we put in so much work. It can be really disheartening. So even just to have a sounding board and to be able to talk to people, we also get assigned mentors from the industry, like producers we greatly admire. And to hear that they often have the same challenges is scary, but also really, you know, <laughs> um, encouraging as well because we all go through the same uphill battle. Um, and oftentimes, you know, film is so much about networking and getting your foot in the door, and it's not just as simple as an email. You really have to have someone vouch for you. So just to have the support of all these organizations to vouch for us when we're pitching is huge because we wouldn't have been able to get these meetings in the first place, so it really has provided a lot of momentum for our own projects. And, of course, the financial support, like especially this has been a particularly hard year for indie film. So it's just been huge to be able to solely focus on our own projects without having to take on a million different jobs as usual um, has been a game changer. Yeah. And I think something that's also important to note is that when filmmakers go from small independent films to larger studio projects, it's often the writers and directors that are making that leap. Mm -hmm. And their producers are not necessarily going with them. So what we're trying to do with our incredible partners at Disney Searchlight and The Leap is to create a pipeline so that the producers are also making that leap. So that they understand the inner workings of what it means to produce in the studio system versus the independent system, which are very, very different, and take slightly different skills. So we're hoping that that does not happen to these three incredible producers and that they are growing with their filmmakers as all producers should be. That's wonderful. I, Dia, I just want to go back to you a little bit more in, in your role as a non arts nonprofit exec. Sure. Um, and like, and the joy that it brings, one, in the project management of a program like Imahinar, but all your work. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I mean, something that's incredible at Film Independent is we get to support all of, the, all of these incredible filmmakers, but also connect them. Um, something that happened, I'd say like now seven, eight years ago, is we supported this really great, I need to stop saying incredible, uh, director Marvin Lemus in Project Involve. Um, and he had an opportunity to develop a, at the time, I believe it was a short episodic project with Macro, which is a uh, black owned production company in LA, but he needed a writer. And he turned to us when he needed a writer. And Francisco Velasquez, who runs PI, Project Involved, um, was like, I have the writer for you. And that writer was Linda Vet Chavez. And they went on to co-create Hentified, which if you have not seen it, see it to incredible seasons in Netflix. And now Linda, of course, wrote The Amazing Flame and Hot. And Marvin has gone on to direct the Alexander the No Good, Very Bad Day. Um, so that's something that like we had a big hand in making that happen and getting to make sure the like filmmaker when a filmmaker meets an opportunity like that that we're able to support them and give them the guidance that they need and the partnerships that they need to flourish. Um, it's I mean they're very close to my heart not just because I love Hentified, um, but because they're wonderful people you know and to get to give a platform to like these good, caring folks that believe in leading from a place of kindness instead of a place of, um, oh, you don't no, need to get into that. Um, and that's something that we do in all forms. I mean, Gia is someone that I've had the pleasure of working with for a number <laughs> of years. Back when I was running Project Involve, um, I got to support Gia. And I knew how special she was, like, from the interview. Um, I, I'm so happy to be able to share the stage with all of these incredible producers and I've spent the last six months working with Maria and Nico and I mean that's honestly, it's why we do what we do is to be able to support these guys and to make sure that they have what they need to push their careers and projects forward. Thank you, so beautifully said and I think what brings us joy too is that we are believing in these artists when they're starting out, even when they're mid-career, when they haven't, you know, perhaps met all the goals that they want to. Um, because to Dia's point earlier, it's not just about the bottom line. There's, there's something that we see, a potential, a voice that we feel that this cultural landscape would benefit in having and seeing. Um, so I think the role of arts nonprofits, organizations like Film Independent, Nalib, Sundance, Gotham, 
play such a crucial role and it's such a challenging time. So I certainly urge you to certainly get involved or support your arts nonprofit um, if you're in a place to do that. Um, I think we're coming down to the last final minutes. I want to make sure that there's a room for people or space for people to comment or have questions. There is a microphone there. If you, oh, well, I mean, you guys, uh, yeah, if you want to step back there, please feel free to um, make a comment or ask questions. We'd love to hear from you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shafali Mystery. I do government relations for Cal State Northridge. Oh, okay. um, my background is actually in the arts. Yay! Um, my background is actually in the arts, so this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, if you can even get through a program where inevitably some of your white faculty don't assign your work as much formal value because it's too ethnic mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, then if you're at a school like ours, California State University, just as like a fun fact, uh, we have over 4 million alumni, which means 1 in 20 Americans with a college degree got their degree at the CSU. Oh. Cal State Northridge, we are number three in the nation for awarding degrees to Hispanic students. Um, and of our film program, so we have a great film program that not a lot of people know about, right? Because we're competing with the Chapmans and the USC's of the region. Um, of our nearly 2,000 students, 45% are Latino. And so, first of all, I would like to say, anybody who's willing to connect with me after this, please do. Yeah, because I would love too. to get love you guys in front of our students. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, like, do you have uh, ideas or recommendations or whatever for how to, we're an under-resourced program, but we're doing the work um, in terms of diversifying the field, right? So um, any recommendations for kind of what we could be doing and how we get our students like in those doors when we don't have the same kind of institutional muscle that other, other schools do? So we actually uh, produced short films in Project Involve and have an internship program that's sponsored by the, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association where we bring on two paid interns to each of those sets and we actually uh, accept applications from folks at all the Cal States yeah. and community colleges. So I think that's a really good place for your students to get some like on the ground um, experience in film, but also, I mean, let's connect. Yes. We should yes. come and talk to your yes. uh, your yeah. filmmakers yeah. and make sure that they know that Film Independent is a resource for them once they graduate. Also, I want to add, I've worked with a number of Northridge students, and they're all incredible. Yeah, so I can really about yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is um, Camila. I lead the inclusive marketing strategy at GEICO. I have two questions for you. Um, if it's not film independent, what are some nonprofit organizations that corporations like GEICO can partner with to have um, underrepresented talent behind the scenes for our commercials that are going to the multicultural um, consumer and underrepresented communities? I think that there, I mean, I think there's a recognition of the importance of diversifying below the line pipelines. And I think there are a lot of studios and production companies that are starting to do that. Ava DuVernay's company has um, a database uh, for you know, BIPOC uh, underrepresented below the line talent. So that's one resource. And I think that there are some other uh, programs within different studios that are also supporting below the line. And as Dia mentioned, our Project Involved program is, has a very, it's very rare in its support of cinematographers and editors. Um, but certainly we, you know, I think for any organization, there, there, there might be ways to find partnerships like with Geico and, and someone else to say, this is very important to us. How can we help build this pipeline? Just like we've done for producers with the Walt Disney Company and Searchlight. So I welcome Geico to think outside of the box and see what else you can do. I mean, I think to what Representative Castro said earlier, storytelling is so influential. And it's not just in front of the camera, but before, behind the camera, too. So if that's something that you're, you're concerned about, we're so excited for you to, to make a change on that front. So thank you. Thank you. My second question is, I love hearing the stories that you were talking about, the films that you have produced as a consumer of content. How can I get access to these films? And if it's on, on Netflix and Max, um, that's fine. But I'm curious to s learn about how can I watch these films. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, there's a variety uh, of, of places to reach. Um, one 
One thing I recommend is actually tapping into Film Independence web talent guide to kind of get to know a lot of filmmakers and oftentimes their work is listed. Um, speaking for my projects, uh, you know, a couple of them are on HBO, on Max, but uh, I think um, I'm always actually also searching for stuff and I, if you're interested in getting to know up and coming filmmakers, places like um, short of the week and Vimeo staff pick for example are platforms that are free where you can get to know um, emerging filmmakers work um, but if you wanted I mean we could also chat after about more specifics on our projects but yeah, I agree. yeah, yeah. Um, I just going to film festivals to always yeah. check like mm -hmm. up and coming emerging talent um, if you're in LA for example La Leaf is a great film festival of just mm -hmm. like Latino yeah. filmmakers um, but yeah, I just think going to festivals is a great, great way to find films. Yeah, Thank you. I've, I've got to you know, plug Film Independent here, because um, <laughs> we are a member-based organization, and our members vote for Spirit Awards, which means that you get screeners for all the Spirit Award films, and that tends to be the best independent films of that specific award cycle. And these, are screen these screeners are virtual, so you don't have to be in LA to be able to access that benefit. Thank you. Um, hi all, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jesus Arzola Vega. I work at Uplift Campaigns. We're a progressive political consulting firm. We work for progressive candidates and causes all over the country and my specific role is scripting, filming and editing ads for our clients. So we work for um, candidates who are queer, uh, you know, persons of color, immigrants. Those are the kind of folks that I help make ads for and get into office. And in my own capacity, I'm also an independent filmmaker. Um, and my question for y'all is like, what advice would you provide to young Latinos that might be aspiring filmmakers or artists but are discouraged because of like the sort of cultural stigma we face? Because you know, in our culture, like a career in the arts isn't always taken seriously. Like I'm just to further elaborate, I'm speaking from experience because like I knew that I wanted to make films since I was a kid, but I grew up in a single parent household, undocumented, low income, and when you tell a, like a single mom who's busting her ass off working to pay the bills that you want a career in the arts, it's almost like a slap in the face in a way. <laughs> Um, so I guess my, advi my question is like what advice would you provide folks and like maybe you can share your own experiences about navigating it if you had similar experiences like when you were pursuing your careers with peers and family who were like oh you're getting a career in the arts like and they didn't take it seriously like how did you navigate that? Um, well I empathize with you a lot for me it was really 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 tough <laughs> when I decided to go into film, especially having worked in finance before, my family was like, you're the worst. <laughs> I can't believe you're doing this to us. Um, but then they had to just, it was a lot of like making them understand that film is an industry like many other industries. Entertainment's like one of the biggest exports the United States has. And like the Latino market is one of the biggest markets and we consume so much media and entertainment and we're doing it more and more and more. We're a growing market. And uh, not only are we in a market, but we can also like create that content too. Um, it's hard to make people understand that that's a viable business model. Like I didn't even understand it myself, which is why it took me so many years to go into it as well. But I guess the only real advice is just close your eyes and jump into the pool because <laughs> what else can you do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I totally relate. Like, my mom has been really supportive, but even now, she's really supportive, but even now, every other month, she's like, are you going to get a real job? We're like, are you making money? And I'm like, haha, yeah, no, but not really. Um, but that really is why accessibility is such a huge driving force for me because it doesn't seem possible, you know, like, the film school I went to was very expensive and I'm very lucky to go to that, but there's such a huge barrier to entry. So just the more representation we have and the more we put it out there, the more feasible it'll seem. And yeah, in terms of like tangible advice, I agree with Nico. It's like it. kind of nutty thing to get into, but yeah, you gotta just do it. <laughs> keep, keep creating. Yeah. Like, uh, write, apply to screenwriting labs, apply to, um do short films with a phone, like just keep on creating things. I think that that's always a very useful thing to mm -hmm. be doing. And if I could just add, and thank you for sharing that, by the way, I empathize a lot. I actually have a very similar background, so happy to chat after. Um, but I think finding community also is super important. Mm -hmm. And if, if it's not the family support, is 
finding those other people that become your family, you know, for the purposes of, of feeling like you are on the path that you're supposed to be on. And I agree with Nico. It is an industry. There is a business that can be viable, and that's what we all, I think, are collectively working towards. And at the end of the day, if you have that love and passion for storytelling, I think it's good to remind those who are skeptical of how powerful a medium it is and how much it can change society for the better. And sometimes that comes with some challenging days, but you know it does pay off and it's very rewarding when it works. Thank you. Hi, my name is Victoria Melendez. Um, and my question kind of dovetails from Jesus's question in that um, I'm really curious for someone who uh, can't go to film school because uh, you already got a nine to five. Um, what is the path, particularly for writers, uh, to connect with producers? Um, and I, I do want to be mindful. I, I'm very much aware of the strike. So, like hypothetically, in the future, when the strike is over, um, what is a writer to do? Um, especially given that often there are requests for samples. How do you, you know, connect with producers to get something made? Especially if you have a really big dream, but you need to like start small. Um, I would encourage you to apply to labs. Yes. Like uh, apply to the screenwriting film independent lab, uh, Sundance app labs. Like um, these labs, everyone keeps their eyes on them. Like uh, and a lot of producers, like um, like they mentioned, like directors are being connected by with writers through these labs as well. So I think that using those art nonprofit resources that we were talking about, it's a great way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and and to add to that, I think don't underestimate how open and willing. Um, other filmmakers are, uh, they want to connect with you also. Like, um, I think uh, in, this, in the spirit of building community, it's so important to start getting to know other writers, independent producers who are incredibly supportive of the current you know, environment we're in for um, meeting the strikes. Um, and I think I receive cold emails all the time, for example, and I, I like engaging, I think, because it go, it's a mutually beneficial um, relationship and also because I've, you know, throughout all these years I've been there. <laughs> um, I also just like, as a little tip, like try to get hands on like an IMDb Pro account <laughs> if you don't have one because uh, there's a lot of contact info on there and trying to understand who works with who and, you know, just even in the independent space, like um, that research time and reading the trades, all of those kind of investing time in getting to know who is working with who can then lead you to, when the time comes, ask um, for those connections. I would just Thank tie you. in and say, um, there is no one path to your end goal. Maybe it includes labs, maybe it doesn't. Finding your community is important. If you're LA based and there's an organization like Film Independent, come to our events. The person next to you is probably doing the same thing and you never know what great community you might find from the person sitting next to you. And then I would also, just to echo to Maria's point, definitely do your research if you're looking for someone. What was your favorite movie? Write a thoughtful and concise email outreach. There's a lot of different ways to get in touch with people and I think as people get busier and as you know, it's harder to respond to everything, your sincerity and your research on why this person is who you're going out to, I think will pay off in dividends. Thank Good you. luck. Um, with that, I know we're running a little bit late, but I just want concluding remarks. Um, we're gonna do something where I like call manifestation, right? Let's, let's put out our big dreams on there on what you would hope for yourselves or the industry um, if anything is possible. We're gonna start with Gia. I want one palm door from Ken, <laughs> but my real manifestation is I really would like to expand um, and make film much more accessible. Like definitely in my border region, I hope to in the near future start a lot of workshops there with the high school kids and middle school kids just to make it more attainable, especially because we don't get a lot of stories on the border that are not about being sad and Latino and all of that. Um, and not only in the border, but in other regions in the U.S. beyond L.A. and New York, I think it's really important. And we're going to get a lot more diverse perspectives that way. Um, yes, mine is similar. I would love to, um, well, be able to 
get a financing arm in my production company to start telling more stories that I want to tell. And I also would like to start focusing and telling stories specifically towards the Latin American market as well. I think that I would love to do both of those things. And in general, I would just, my biggest dream is for producing to actually become more sustainable for people overall. Because mm -hmm. I think that um, it's a very tough industry and producers are really needed, but the turnaround is huge because it's really, really unsustainable. So I think like if in the future it's more accessible to everyone, we'll just have very better stories overall. Um, I want everything you just said. And on, <laughs> and on top of that, no, um, I. Yes, so at a personal level, I hope to um, have a financing arm on my, at my company so that I can have even more power over what kinds of films are made um, and the scale to look everything from, you know, a first-time filmmaker all the way to the most established person and have kind of uh, the ability to produce across that spectrum. Um, and for kind of broader, uh, I think, what I, I hope that we get to is a place where representation is so inherently built in and so organic and natural that we don't even have to like talk about it as you know filling quotas and such, but rather it just feels so natural to the world that the world that we are all living in day to day and seeing that representation um, in the films and TV that we are all consuming. Um, as much as I love what I do, and I love it passionately, I would love for it not to be necessary. Um, I, you know, for all of this to just be a natural part of the filmmaking process, and for diversity and inclusion to just be like the air that we breathe, you know, just part of um, what we do every day. And then another point that is important for me is to remove the economic barrier of accessing film and not just from the filmmaking side but also from the industry side it's incredibly difficult to rise through the ranks if you are not um, someone that comes from money and I think that that really shapes the type of decision makers that we have in the industry because it's so inaccessible so I, I wish assistants got paid more. <laughs> Thank you, Dia. I 150% agree. Um, thank you to our panelists for sharing your insights. Thanks, thank everyone. you to each of you for spending your afternoon with us. Um, and we hope you have a great CHCI.